Muggles, all right. Well, good evening, Muggles. Welcome. My name is Daniel McInerney. I'm Associate Director of the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture, and I'm very pleased to welcome you here this evening to the very first event of our Center's 2007-2008 season, this colloquium entitled Harry Potter and the King's Cross. Before I tell you a little bit more about our panel this evening, I want to give a plug to another uh, upcoming Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture event. This fall, we're going to be sponsoring our annual Catholic Culture Series devoted to great Catholic literature, and this year's series is devoted to Shakespeare and his relationship to Catholicism. It's going to consist in four lectures on four consecutive Tuesday nights, beginning next Tuesday night, September 18th, in the Barlow Room 155. There will be a talk by Mr. Joseph Pierce from Ave Maria University in Florida. He's working on a biography of Shakespeare, and he'll be talking about Shakespeare's Catholicism, but there will also be talks in the series by Peter Holland, a professor here at Notre Dame in FTT, by Professor John Finnis, also here at Notre Dame, and Mrs. Claire Asquith. So please mark your calendars for that series. You can find uh, information about all four dates on our center's website. Well, it's at the very heart of the mission of the Notre Dame Center for Ethics and Culture to reflect on the perils and promises of our contemporary culture using the very best resources of the Catholic moral and intellectual tradition. And I think we'll all agree that there is no cultural phenomenon that has had more of a global reach, that has been more lucrative, and that has been more prodigious in its power to attract than the seven Harry Potter novels authored by J.K. Rowling. This hasn't just been a phenomenon of the popular culture. The fact that we have two highly trained um, academic philosophers chomping at the bit here tonight to share with you their thoughts on Harry Potter testifies that this phenomenon has spread, has spread to what we can call high culture as well. <laughs> a quick look at just some of the basic facts about the series is dizzying. My internet research just this afternoon told me that over 325 million copies of the Harry Potter books have so far been sold, books which have been translated into 65 different languages. Just the other day, on September the 10th, Warner Brothers announced that the Harry Potter film franchise is now the most lucrative film franchise ever in the history of cinema, having grossed $4.47 billion in ticket sales and surpassing the Star Wars series and the James Bond series. J.K. Rowling herself is now ranked as the 13th richest person in Britain and Ireland, with her worth valued at $545 million pounds, that is, and as, we, as you probably all know, she is indeed richer than the Queen. So we have a phenomenon indeed with this text. It's a text that perhaps the Bible, notwithstanding, has had the biggest popular reach ever in the history of Homo sapiens. But like all great texts, the Bible included, it has enjoyed its own share of controversy. Some of that controversy has been just purely literal, literary. Excuse me. High-octane literary critics uh, like Harold Bloom, A.N. Wilson, writers such as A.S. Baya, and even Stephen King have taken time out to write critical praises of J.K. Rowling's work. But some of the controversy, too, has been more moral and theological. And it's the moral and theological aspect of the books that is going to be uh, the theme of our symposium here tonight. I'd like now to introduce our three panelists. And I'm going to introduce them in the order in which they are going to speak. First of all, Professor Rebecca DeYoung comes to us from Calvin College in Grand Rapids, Michigan, where she is a professor of philosophy. 
Professor de Young is no stranger to the University of Notre Dame. She did her doctoral degree here under the supervision of our center's director, David Solomon, right here. So we're very happy to have <coughs> Professor de Young back. She specializes in the thought of St. Thomas Aquinas and in virtue ethics more generally, though in recent years she's been focusing on the flip side of virtues, that is, the vices, and is doing some very interesting and important work on the seven capital sins. Our second panelist tonight is Professor John O'Callaghan from the University of Notre Dame's own philosophy department. Professor O'Callaghan also received his doctoral degree here at the University of Notre Dame. He specializes in medieval philosophy, in Thomas Aquinas as well, especially Aquinas' metaphysics. Most pertinent to tonight's event, however, Professor O'Callaghan is the author of the article Harry Potter Catholic Boy, which originally appeared in the Portland Magazine, but also in 2004 earned a place in a volume, Best Catholic Writing for 2004. So Harry Potter is someone that Professor O'Callaghan has reflected much about and has been honored for. Lastly, we have Mr. Emerson Sparks, an undergraduate here at Notre Dame, a native of La Porte, Indiana, a resident of Knott Hall, a major in business. in business, and as you all probably know him best for, he is the founder, owner, and webmaster of MuggleNet.com. He is also, I would gather, the only person in the room tonight who has actually met with J.K. Rowling <coughs> privilege of interviewing her in the summer of 2005 in connection with the release of the sixth book, um, Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. So now we turn to our symposium, <coughs> Harry Potter and the King's Cross, and the format here is going to be very straightforward. Each one of the three panelists is going to get some 12 to 15 minutes to make some general remarks, after which we're going to open it up to you for questions and for discussion. So let me hand the microphone over now to Professor Dion. First thing I need to ask is whether I'm mic'd well enough. Can you hear me in the back? You good? Okay. The other thing is um, there's a handout that I brought along for which I did not bring enough copies. So those of you in the lower rows, you know, feel the impulse to share if you would like. It's a handout with quotations on the front and on the back, a rough outline of what I'm going to say. For those of you who fall asleep in the middle of five minutes, you'll be able to wake up and still catch the general gist of the thing. Um, I'm going to mostly read this talk for the sake of time. And if you give academics a stand-up routine, they tend to go overboard. So I'll be lively, but um, I'm probably going to stick to my manuscript more or less unless I get tempted to diverge. Um, thanks for your introduction, um, and thanks to the Center for um, having me here, and thanks to J.K. Rowling for writing some of the best books I've read in the last 10 years. It's been a pleasure. Um, as my daughter Alexandra in the front row knows, um, we fight over the book when it first arrives. You know, who's going to get to read it first? Um, I do moral philosophy as a living, as a philosopher. I think J.K. Rowling does more philosophy, but as a writer. Uh, we philosophers desperately need writers. Um, for one thing, they're more interesting, typically. Um, but because moral philosophy is not something we do primarily to become smarter philosophers, uh, we do moral philosophy, at least if Aristotle was right, in order to become better people, better persons, better parents, and so on. Um, and perhaps to help our students and our children become better people, too. Doing moral philosophy with this practical aim in mind, I think, takes pictures. It takes people who embody the virtues, people we can imitate. It takes role models. Uh, sometimes they come from fiction, sometimes they come from film, sometimes they come from scripture, and sometimes from real life, people who embody the virtues. We learn to have good character by imitating these people. We need heroes and role models to pattern our lives after. So I think it's very important then to look at the kind of role models we get in fiction, in film, and in real life, the kind of cultural ideals that we're exposed to, um, to think about what kind of pictures of character and virtue they give us. So in her books, J.K. Rowling gives us a picture 
of the virtue of courage. So I'm going to skip the vice stuff tonight and go to virtues. But if you want me to talk about pride later, I have another whole paper on that. I can't um, so she gives us a picture of the Gryffindors in general as courageous, of James, Sirius, Lupin as courageous, Ron and Hermione as courageous, Dumbledore and Snape, we find out in the last <coughs> book, in Lily, of course, and most of all, in that scene in the forest in Harry himself. And that's the scene I'm going to focus on in my talk tonight. Now, courage is the virtue concerned with strength and power. How do different pictures of power and strength, fear and vulnerability, shape our pictures of what this virtue is? Tonight, I'm going to suggest to you that Rowling gives us a fairly radical and radically Christian picture of power and courage. Now, what's remarkable about her picture of Harry's courage in Book 7 is the way it resonates with the way Christians have thought about and talked about courage throughout the ages, from St. Augustine to Thomas Aquinas to John Paul II to Martin Luther King Jr. And this picture of distinctively Christian courage gives us, I think, a thought-provoking contrast with what I'll call our common or contemporary notion of courage. Think of this picture as the one found in your average action-adventure film starring Tom Cruise in Mission Impossible, for example. Um, or doesn't, doesn't Bruce Willis have any Die Hard out now, too? Yeah. That's sort of another one of those classics. Um, so I want to examine how Harry's courage is different from the courage of our culture's heroic ideal. I also want to contrast Harry's courage with the moral character of Voldemort. I will argue that Voldemort cannot have the virtue of courage in any form. Now, Rowling's picture of Harry's courage gives us a positive model of a higher kind of courage, I think, and also a warning because we, like our contemporary action heroes, are tempted to put our faith in our own power, which I think tempts us to become more and more like Voldemort if we're not careful. So there's a practical <coughs> and the whole lecture tonight. So tonight I'm going to consider those three models of character. The first is the American action adventure hero model of courage. The second is Voldemort's character um, and his view of fear and power and death. And lastly, I'm going to consider Harry's courage, setting it against those two models that we discussed first, and explaining how his courage is the kind of courage championed by the Christian tradition throughout many centuries and even up to today. So first, let's think through that action-adventure model of courage. This model of courage is inspiring, no doubt, and noble, and certainly fun to watch on the big screen. Right? I go to all those movies, too. <clears throat> the mark of this hero is that he rushes in and does something to ward off the evil that threatens. He fights the bad guys, and he wins. He uses aggressive means, he even uses violence, and he achieves justice in the end. Hooray. So we all walk out of the theater feeling great and cheering. He's a rescuer. He's a problem fixer. He's a fighter. He's someone who can do something about evil and do it with his own physical strength and power and ingenuity. Not coincidentally, this hero is almost always male. I'll get to that again in a minute. Like all courageous people, our action-adventure hero is willing to suffer, is willing to risk himself, his life, um, put up with injury, and face his fears in order to achieve a good end. But in the end, this sort of courage is often a picture of human power, the power to triumph over evil using our own strength. And that power is usually physical or military power, hence the male model. It involves the use of force, brute strength, bigger guns, whatever. It easily trades on our desire to solve our own problems, on our own terms, and by ourselves. That's the pride link. Note that the action-adventure hero usually does it his own way. He steps in when the government fails or the police are found inept, which they always are, and he faces the enemy all by himself. He's an autonomous actor. He goes in alone. Now, I think there's something right about this model. There's something we're celebrating and affirming. The action-adventure hero acts for justice. He fights for a good cause, and he's willing to risk his own life, not other people's lives, for the sake of that good cause. So he is courageous. But we should be wary of the way that this model tends to glorify human power and its ability to overcome all evil. We should be wary, I think, of a hero who never needs anyone else, who expects to be able to conquer evil and evade death on his own strength and his own terms. So much for the first model. This brings us now to Voldemort. 
I think Rowling deliberately depicts Voldemort as lacking courage, um, and she does so typically through the voice of Dumbledore. In fact, I think it's impossible for Voldemort, unlike our action-adventure hero, to have this virtue. Courage is the virtue that enables us to stand firm against our fear of injury, difficulty, and ultimately death, for the sake of a good end that transcends us. Courage requires that we, we realize that there is some good bigger than us. A good that facing danger and risking death can, in some cases, protect or preserve. Courage is a safeguarding virtue. Standing fast against our fears, even our fear of death, is good only because it enables some other good beyond us to be safeguarded or enabled or protected. Why can't Voldemort have courage? Because for him, his life is the greatest good. He loves nothing but himself. There is nothing in Voldemort's universe worth risking his own life for. No one and nothing worth dying for. He can't recognize any good that transcends himself. That means death is the greatest evil for him. As Rowling says herself, he regards death as ignominious. He thinks it's a shameful human weakness. His worst fear is death. <coughs> because his own life is the greatest good, his greatest quest is pr to protect and preserve himself at all costs. And for that, he needs the power to defy death. Now, fear, which courage primarily has to do with, is our response to things that threaten us. How do you get rid of fear? By accumulating power for ourselves. Enough power to overcome whatever threatens us even, and ultimately, power over death. Voldemort's quest is not to stand firm in the face of fear. His quest is to eliminate fear, especially the fear of death. Ultimately, the way to get rid of all fear, of course, is to become invincible, all-powerful, yes, godlike. <coughs> so when Emerson uh, interviewed Rowling, he asked her what would Voldemort see if he were in front of the mirror of Arisa. And she replies, he would see himself, all-powerful and eternal. That's what he wants. So Voldemort is infatuated with power, his own power, because he seeks to be above death. He seeks to be immortal. He seeks to be beyond the possibility of fear. Now, ideally, he won't need courage, that is, if he's successful, because he will have eliminated his own vulnerability to death and any possibility of his own weakness or suffering. Now, what's scary, I think, about Voldemort's agenda is how closely it can resemble our own culture's agenda. Okay, so this is the look in the mirror moment. Look at the way we often use military might, genetic engineering, medical treatments, and physical force to try to eliminate human weaknesses and vulnerabilities, to try to become above death, invulnerable, superhuman. Our natural response to the threat of death, the ultimate form of human vulnerability, is to aggressively defend ourselves against it at all costs, to eliminate the possibility of it as far as we can with our own power, to treat it as the worst possible thing that could befall us. That's our cultural read on death. As John Paul II once famously said, we live in, quote, a cultural climate which fails to perceive any meaning or value in suffering but rather consider suffering the epitome of evil to be eliminated at all costs. Unquote. That's from Evangelium Vitae. So this is a view of death and weakness, I think, in our culture, that makes the search for power and control paramount over all other aims. Like Dumbledore's quest for the hallows and his mistaken quest for the greater good, like our culture's pursuit of more and more control over life and death, the worry is that we're going to try and use power to overcome our vulnerabilities in ways that deny or uh, limit our humanness, in ways that trample the weak. This is not courage, but a perversion of it. This is a selfish, worldly view of power and what power is for. It makes us less human, not fully human. So human power to overcome suffering and death in the end, as we usually discover, is so inadequate it's so pathetic. It doesn't do the job. And this is why we're so, I think, tempted to go to extremes. Notice the action-adventure hero often shading into the superhero genre, right? Because you need superhuman powers or power-enhancing props like the Elder Wand. 
Like the young Dumbledore, our action hero, moral ideal, often tempts us, I think, toward a selfish obsession with our own self-sufficiency and power. Even when we are engaged in a fight against injustice, like the action hero, how often do we rely on merely human power to save the day and assume that we are able to secure justice all by ourselves? The danger of the action hero model of courage is that it can easily slide into a Voldemort-like choice to build our lives around human power and then to enhance human power to reach superhuman or even divine levels. So that's the temptation, that's the worry. So turning to our third model then, Harry, we should ask what makes Harry's case of courage different from the action hero's aggression and different from Voldemort's plan to eliminate the possibility and the fear of death altogether. Now, in the Christian tradition, the virtue of courage is always going to be rooted in love. Courage, and I'll put it in scare quotes, courage without love is mere gritted teeth, and facing death, quite frankly, is pointless. The courageous person does not seek death. She does not glorify it. In fact, she naturally fears it. She recognizes and values the life she lays down. Her sacrifice is not a suicide. What enables her to conquer her fear of death is not, however, faith in her own power, but in her faith in the power of love. The good she loves enables her to face her fear. In courage, your love has to be greater than your fear of death. There has to be something or someone that you love more than you love your own life. So it's inherently selfless. St. Augustine defines courage, and this is on your sheet, the second side, as, quote, love bearing all things for the sake of the beloved, end quote. Hence the title of my talk. He could have been writing about Holy Potter when he said that, or a Harry. Now, Augustine's definition of courage might also describe the action-adventure hero. It might describe Sirius or James or Lupin, for example. But how is Harry's sacrifice then different? Many centuries ago, Thomas Aquinas made a distinction between two types of courage. He called them aggression, that's the first type, and endurance, that's the second type. Aggression is your fight-back response to a threat. Endurance, on the other hand, is the form of courage required when fighting back is something that you cannot or should not do. Endurance, says Aquinas, is not a walk-all-over-me doormat response. It's a rather the very highest form or expression of courage. Like aggression, it is deliberately chosen, an act of resistance to evil, for the sake of preserving some good. So all forms of true courage are going to share that much. But unlike aggression, this form of resistance, the form that we get in endurance, is, um, is, does not use force or violence against evil. It rather takes the form of laying your life down in self-sacrifice. <coughs> Death is not sought as a good, nor is it sought at all. <coughs> rather, it is endured as the only way to preserve and stay faithful to the good that you love. Okay, so it's required by love. For Harry, to choose to live <coughs> would compromise the good of everyone he loved. And it, it's the failure of Peter Pettigrew that provides the contrast term here, right? He had people he loved, and yet his fear was so great that he wasn't able to stand firm against it and risk death. And in the end, he betrayed everything that he loved. And then he had to live with that choice. So to face death for Harry was a choice demanded by love and faithfulness to the good. Harry's courage to endure death, to lay down his life, is the kind of courage Christian thinkers like Aquinas and Augustine were talking about. Aquinas says the martyrs give us a picture of this kind of courage, and the martyrs, in turn, are imitating Christ. Aquinas defines this act of courage in terms of the power of love. He says, greater love has no one than this, that one lay down one life for one friends, quoting John 15. This picture of courage, laying down your life out of love for another, is a picture of love for others powerful enough to withstand fear, not, as in the first two models, a case of facing fear or eliminating fear on the basis of our own power, whether physical or magical. Harry deliberately sets aside his wand, and as Rowling puts it, so he wouldn't be tempted to use it. He wouldn't be tempted to avail himself of his own power. 
Um, and he deliberately chooses to pursue the Horcruxes, not the Hallows. So he deliberately chooses the lay down your life method, not the power seeking method of handling evil and fear. Instead, he follows Lily's example, her courageous choice to lay down her life to endure death for the sake of love. And so Rowling's picture of courage stands in this tradition of thinking about courage in terms of the power of love, not the power of human strength or the quest for the power over death. And this is why Lily, a woman, and Harry, a teenager with inferior wizarding powers, can be a picture of this sort of courage. In fact, this is why you can too. <coughs> because courage's strength is ultimately rooted, not in brute strength, but in the power of love. Only this kind of love for another has the power to bear all things. Quote from 1 Corinthians 13. Voldemort cannot have courage because he has not love. A mark of courageous endurance and its understanding of power is that love is not self-sufficient or autonomous. So here's another contrast with the aggression model. The action-adventure hero is a rugged individualist. He works alone. He depends on himself. Voldemort, of course, acts only for himself and uses others as disposable means to his own good. But Harry essentially relies on his friends throughout the books. And in his death, in that great death scene, where he walks through the forest, I think it's crucial that he claims the power of the communion of the saints by using the resurrection stone to surround himself with those whose love has formed him. It is Harry's decision. It is Harry's act. But, as Rowling writes, their presence was his courage. Love binds us together in community. Love recognizes that we are not meant to be self-sufficient, self-reliant. We flourish in solidarity, not solitude. Aquinas says that fear is born of love. What we fear most depends on what we love most. So do a little homework check on yourself tonight. Write down your greatest fears and try to figure out what sort of loves they grow from. Voldemort fears death most because he loves his own life more than anything else. His fears are rooted in selfish self-love. Harry, on the other hand, can face death courageously because he loves something beyond himself and his own life. His love of others and their good, and his desire to protect them, is a love that is stronger than the fear of death. This is nothing less than charity, the greatest of the virtues. In the end, it is a power that transcends Harry, the power of powerful protection of his mother's love that enables him to endure. It is not his own wizarding skill, or intestinal fortitude, or brute strength that saves the day. <coughs> Harry's love for others ultimately transforms his fear of power and defines his courage. And this picture of power and courage is one and love. It's one that echoes through many centuries of the Christian moral tradition. We're indebted to J.K. Rowling for her fresh articulation of this picture of moral virtue in Harry Potter, a role model of courage whose defining name should perhaps not have been the boy who lived, but rather the boy who loved. Thank you.
entirely opposite. And so what I want to speak about today, and I, I will try to do this very quickly, is God in Harry Potter. Uh, very recently, after the seventh book came out, Time Magazine ran an essay where uh, the author said, the thing that died in the Harry Potter novels, uh, in the seven Harry Potter novels, is God. And of course, what was meant there was not God in the sense of the sacrificial death of Christ and so on. What the author meant was that you get a, mora a kind of morality tale in which God is utterly absent. And uh, this is a, a purely secular tale about morality. Uh, and this particular author, I think, was lamenting that, but nonetheless uh, felt that God was not at all present in the Harry Potter novels. And what, as I say, what I want to argue, or at least suggest tonight, is that God is everywhere in the Harry Potter novels. But you have to look at them in a certain way and read them in a certain way, and that is read them beyond the level of the mere plot. Certainly the mere plot has an awful lot to do with moral life and courage and the virtues and so on and so on. But once you go to a lot, uh, deeper levels of meaning, you start to see the ways in which God is everywhere in the novel. My wife said, with regard to that objection, that God isn't in the plot. She said, well, suppose God had been in the plot as an explicit character in some fashion. The problem with that is, of course, everything gets washed up. All of the characters suddenly become unimportant because there's God in the story. There's Christ in the story, whatever. It just gets washed out of the plot, all the, all the other interesting characters. And if you think about it, uh, Soren Kierkegaard said, uh, it's a sacrilege. It's sacrilegious to call the Bible the greatest story ever told. Because that places the Bible in the setting of a literary work. And what he meant by that was that other stories aren't like this. And you can ask yourselves, have you ever read a good book about Jesus other than Scripture? Where's a good novel in which Jesus figures? No, you don't read these books. Why? Because they make everything else unimportant. That is, Christ in the plot. So what I want to say is, if you learn to read appropriately, you will in fact see God all over the place. So I'll start with this um, little passage from Wittgenstein. Only when one knows the story does one know the significance of the picture. And the point I want to make here is that once you place this story, this picture that you get in the seven novels, into a larger story in Western culture, particularly a symbolic culture, primarily understood um, against the background of medieval symbols, you see God everywhere. Now to start, though, before even talking about uh, Harry Potter, I want to ask you, well, I'm not going to ask you because we don't have enough time. If, I was, if we had more time, I would ask you to tell me what you think of this picture. But this is a tapestry, a medieval tapestry that hangs in the Museum of the Middle Ages in Paris. And if you look at this tapestry, you might say, what would you say in answer to the question, what's this tapestry about? The first thing you might say is, well, this tapestry has a lion holding some sort of flag. It has a lady. It has a unicorn with its forepaws in the lady's lap. And it looks like there's a mirror there. And you know it's a mirror because you can see the unicorn in the mirror. Okay? So you might say, that's the first level of the story. That's just basically the plot of the story. Now, if you go into the museum in Paris, they'll say, well, there's another level of meaning here. There are four other tapestries that accompany this, all of them with this lion, this unicorn, this lady, and all these other creatures in there. And uh, what the mirror does, at a deeper level, level of symbolism, what the mirror tells you is that this tapestry is about the sense of sight. And you'll look at the other four tapestries and you'll see that there's something else going on in the different tapestries, each of which can be associated with a different sense of, a uh, different one of the five senses, touch, hearing, smell, and so on. But this one's about sight because she's holding the mirror. And that's all they'll tell you in the Museum of the Middle Ages in Paris. But now, suppose I said, so we have a medieval tapestry, sorry. Suppose I said to you, there's an account in the Middle Ages not necessarily thought of in the Middle Ages as mythological. We would now think of it mythologically. But in the Middle Ages, there was a belief. They actually thought there were unicorns. And there was this sort of story that said, well, if a virgin could capture a unicorn, this pure, spotless, white animal, 
If a virgin could capture a unicorn and have itself, have it lay itself in the lap of a virgin, then the virgin could have whatever wish she had, she wanted. Well, in uh, medieval symbolism, what that becomes then is the unicorn is a symbol of Christ. The woman is a symbol of the Virgin Mary. That's easy once you put it in that mythological setting. Now, um, I, want to, I will ask this, and somebody can, if you do it quickly enough, what's that? It's a monstrance. And a monstrance is an object right, from religious practice where the Eucharist is placed in the monstrance for adoration. Let's go back with a little bit. Is there a monstrance here? What's the monstrance? That mirror. Now you would only see that mirror as a monstrance if you inhabited a certain form of life in which you have Eucharistic adoration. And notice also about the tapestry. The unicorn is not looking at itself in the mirror. The mirror is doing something. By the way, all of this, if there are any art majors or art faculty or uh, literature faculty or literature majors, most of what I say you'll laugh at, right? This is kind of this stuff on the cheap. But what's happening in the tapestry is the mirror is doing something called breaking the frame. The mirror is actually presented to you. Right? If you look at the perspective in it, the unicorn is not looking into the mirror. The lady's holding it in such a way that the image from the unicorn is shown to you. So you uh, might say there's a third level of symbolism here, a third story. And this is a story about the Eucharist. And the background for this is the, um, uh, from Scripture, in this life we see as in a glass darkly. Latin means spectacle, which meant a glass in the Middle Ages was a mirror. So we see Christ in the mirror, which is the monstrance. The lion is holding a flag. Well, that flag has three crescent moons on it. The crescent moon in medieval symbolism, in early church symbolism, was a symbol of the Virgin Mary. So you have the king holding the standard of the Virgin Mary, who is in fact presenting Christ in her lap to you through a mirror, which is a monstrance. It's a whole level of meaning that is simply absent from the ordinary way in which you would look at this if you don't know the story, the larger story within which it's set. And I want to say, read Harry Potter that way, and you'll see God is everywhere. All right. So, the three stories in the tapestry, I just went through that. Sticking. Try to do this here, get this on one time. Interesting coincidence. Uh, sorry. Here I was trying to go fast and I messed up by doing that. Uh, there's an interesting coincidence. I asked some people who know this, the novels much better than I do whether this was actually in the book. This is a screen capture from the movie. Can you see in the background what's hanging on the wall in the Gryffindor common room? That's that tapestry. Right? And they come down from the dormitory through the line. <laughs> Now, uh, my, the real experts tell me that's nowhere in the books. That's put in there by the movie makers. But it's an interesting thing to put in from the movie. They seem to know what I was going to talk about. So if you look at your handout, the first thing I want to talk about, or just go through very quickly, there are three, three sorts of symbols in the books. There's the symbolic names, the symbolic uh, objects, and the symbolic objects or animals, and the symbolic scenes. And one of the things I want to make clear, and we'll talk a little bit about this uh, as I finish up, is I'm not arguing that the Harry Potter novels are an allegory. Right? They're not an allegory. They're not retelling the story of redemption with figures standing in. What I'm going to argue is that, there, that Harry is a Christ figure. Harry is not Christ, but Harry is a Christ figure, a symbol, designed to bring up to mind the story, but not retelling the story. And that's why all of this is symbolic rather than allegorical, with the exception of one scene. So we have these names, and I'll just go right through them very quickly. And you can ask questions about it later if you want. Draco, that's snake in Latin. Malfoy, break it down. Malfoy is Malfoy, bad faith. In Latin, Malfide. Lucius, Lucifer, that's easy. Lily, this is very interesting. Again, 
against the background of this, this unicorn, Lily, is a medieval symbol for the Virgin Mary. That's going to actually be important in a second. Patronus. Well, that's easy. That's where we get the word patron. And we have expecto, uh, expecto patronum. I await a patron, a patron saint. Horcrux. This was really hard, actually. Somebody had to break it down for me, so I can't uh, claim credit for this. Although I get the Latin. My friend just took the whore from horrible. But horrible has the root in the Latin. Horare crux. Horare means to dread, to um, abhor, to shrink away from. It's the dreaded cross. Voldemort. Voldemort. Wish, desire, or will for death. God, this is kind of fun, and this is important in a particular scene. That's a pre-Norman conquest English name, and it means the power of God. Gryffindor, that's old, that's Gryffindor, or Golden Griffin in French. The Griffin is, well, we'll get to that, not in the uh, symbolic object. <laughs> and Hallows, that just means holy. All Hallows Eve, the saints. Eve of all saints. So Hallows, all right. Symbolic objects, animals or people. The Basilisk, that's a snake. And that's the devil. Much of a place, a big part of medieval symbols, but actually is even in scripture uh, in the Vulgate. Griffin, so this object, this animal, has the head of an eagle in the body of a lion. And in, so in the Middle Ages, and again, remember, we think it's a mythological beast. It's not clear that in the Middle Ages they thought it was mythological, as opposed to a beast that no one's ever seen, but there are stories of it. But it was taken, right? it's not Christ, but it signifies Christ in the Middle Ages. Why? Because of the two natures. The terrestrial lion, right, and the heavenly eagle. So a griffin is a symbol of Christ. So, an object, the sword of God, Godric Gryffindor. Put Godric together with Gryffindor, and what do you have? The power of God plus Christ. The sword of Godric Gryffindor is the power of Christ. The sorting hat judges character and uh, protects Harry in the Chamber of Secrets. That's virtue. That's a, maybe a stretch. Rebecca will tell me whether I'm right about that. The deer by the waterside, the Patronus, Harry's father. That's Psalm 42.1. As the heart panteth by the waterside, so my soul longs for thee. You look at medieval art and you will see a deer portrayed next to the water, and that's understood to be a symbol of faithfulness. Faithfulness and fidelity. So James Potter is the stag, his patron. And Severus Snake, he's the doe. Two different uh, uh, deer. Harry's real godfather. Sirius, we thought he was God Harry's godfather. Who's Harry's real godfather? Severus. And so he names his child after Severus. Severus was faithful to the <coughs> And suffered more than anybody else, as it turns out. In the novels. The phoenix, this one's easy. Phoenix, um, we all learn at some point or another, is a symbol of Christ because it was believed that the phoenix is consumed in a, in a fiery holocaust, reduced to ashes, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, but then on the third day rises. Right? So, a medieval symbol of Christ. But there's an interesting thing that Rowling does in the Chamber of Secrets. This has nothing to do with the medieval symbol. Has the phoenix weep upon Harry's deadly wound, on his mortal wound. So you have the symbol of Christ, and then you have this use of tears. Well, if you're, uh, you're probably too young, Trivial Pursuit, the game, existed before most of you were born. But one of the great questions in Trivial Pursuit is, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? It's not the math. It's Jesus wept. When did Jesus weep? I mean, that's the hard part, right? The easy part is Jesus wept. What's the end of Jesus week? Just before he raises Lazarus from the dead. So she associates this, these tears of this symbol of Christ with bringing someone back to life from a mortal wound. And the unicorn, we already um, talked a little bit about that. In the first book, we have the idea that the sacrifice of the unicorn and drinking of the blood brings eternal life. But, as we find out from Voldemort at the dark, from Dumbledore at the end, it's a cursed eternal life. 
if the sacrifice is involuntary. And the question I want you to think about for when we reach the end is, what happens if the sacrifice of the unicorn is voluntary? Not involuntary as it is in the first book, but voluntary. And i uh, sort of give it away there a little bit. Think about Gary as the unicorn. Remember, he passes out from the pain of the slaughter of the unicorn, and has the first kind of memory of the slaughter of his mother. And he sat in his mother's lap. We know this, right? That's what babies do. He sat in his mother's lap. And his mother is named Lily. So, last part here. Symbolic scenes. Now, one of these isn't actually symbolic. One of these is just... Rowling being explicit, but the first symbolic, well, so the four that um, I mentioned here, the Chamber of Secrets, the burial, burial of Moody's Eye, the church and the graveyard, and the pilgrimage to King's Cross, or of King's Cross. So this again is a screen capture from uh, the Chamber of Secrets movie. We see Harry here driving the sword of Gondor Gryffindor into the basilisk. This scene is is, uh, in the books, frankly allegorical in a number of ways. It's an allegory of the story of St. George and the Dragon. If you're familiar with the story of St. George and the Dragon, there's a dragon that's killing the, uh, the uh, inhabitants of the city, so the king seeks for aid, sends his daughter out, and so on. St. George comes along. St. George does battle with the dragon, is bit by the dragon, falls to the ground, and depending on the story, there's two different ways that you'll hear the story. Either falls into a river, and the waters of the river cleanse the wound and bring St. George back to life. Or he falls on the ground and rain starts to come from the sky, and the rain brings him back to life. And then he goes on to defeat the dragon. This particular painting is from a church in Venice by, uh, by an Italian artist called Carpaccio. And in the same church, by the way, you can Google all of them, oh, because I haven't been to this church. There's another legend portrayed in a painting, and it's called St. Torfina and the Basilisk. Unfortunately, St. Torfina has come upon bad times since Vatican II. He's like St. Christopher been dropped from the roles of saints, because there's no clear evidence that there ever was such a figure. But the legend of St. Torfina was that there was an emperor whose daughter was possessed by a demon. And St. Torfine comes and casts the demon out into a basilisk. Now, at the time that Carpaccio was painting, it was thought that a basilisk was kind of a winged dog, not a snake you know, from scripture. <laughs> so he casts the, the demon into the basilisk and then does battle with the basilisk and kills the basilisk. These two paintings from the same church, St. George and the Dragon and the Basilisk, and St. Torfine. So this, this scene, as I say, is allegorical uh, with regard to that. Well, too far. It's also allegorical with regard to the phoenix flying them out of the prison. They hold on to the tail feathers of the phoenix. The phoenix is a symbol of Christ. Christ comes down to the, to the prison and delivers them up as they hold on to his tail feathers. That's the harrowing of hell in the Apostles' Creed. The idea is that Christ descended into hell to deliver the just men and women of the Old Testament. Dante in the Inferno has this as well. When Christ entered in, the reason hell is in, is in uh, ruins in the Inferno is because when Christ came into it to deliver them out and to take them out, Hell could not stand, uh, bear the presence of Christ and fell apart. And if you remember in the story, when the phoenix comes down and they start to fly out, the chamber of secrets starts to crumble into a ruin. So that, those scenes are, frankly, allegorical. Okay. Uh, what were my other ones here? Uh, the burying of Moody's eye. Now, as I say, that's not really symbolic. That's explicit. Most people seem to have missed this that I point out point to them. What did Harry do after he buried the eye? Anybody remember? Those of you who, uh, other than those of you who have talked to me about this. Yeah. He 
he marked the spot on a tree, which of course the tree is symbolic of the cross, he placed a cross over the grave on the tree. That's not symbolic, that's explicit. What's interesting about it, of course, is this, the seventh book, showed this reverence for the dead that we didn't see in the previous books. Remember, when he buries Dobby, he says, I'm going to do it by hand, not by magic. There's a kind of reverence for the dead. And that scene leads us into the graveyard. In the graveyard, we get the two scriptural quotations. The last we can't, well, the first scriptural quotation is, where your treasure is, there also is your heart. Okay? And um, uh, the other one being, the last to be conquered shall be death. And uh, those are on the passage uh, symbolic scene. So, uh, where is it? Do I have those? Yes. Where are they? I can't read because the print is so small. <laughs> well, I have a sort of thing. But uh, both of them, are, one is one, the where your, where your uh, treasure is, there also is your heart. That's about heaven. If you look at the larger passage, that's about um, life after death. The other one, right, the last to be conquered shall be death, is precisely about the sacrifice of Christ in the resurrection. Those two inscriptions, so we're getting some all again, those two inscriptions are on two graves. But if you remember the scene as you enter into the graveyard, the first thing is Christmas Eve, so the night before Christ is born. And you hear the Christmas carols in the church. But now if you remember, your experience of, of stained glass windows is typically to be inside the church. And the light from the outside illumines the stained glass windows and presumably, symbolically, illumines your experience of the faith within the sacred ceremony. What Rowling does is she reverses the illumination. It's at night. There's snow everywhere. It's dark. And she describes going through the graveyard. The carols about the, about the birth of Christ are being sung. And the inside of the church is lit. And because the inside of the church is lit, the light from within the church, in anticipation of the birth of Christ, comes through the stained glass windows and illumines the graveyard. So what's taking place within the church illuminates the graves with these scriptural quotations. Okay? So, um, again, God is there. Now, let's see, I think we're almost to the last, or we are, should be to the last one. The death march. Right? To the king, to, as I put it, the king's cross. And this is where I should have titled my talk, Harry Potter and the Horcrux of Christ, rather than Harry Potter and the Cross of Christ. Now we all know these Horcruxes are supposed to be awful objects. That's at the level of plot, the first level of meaning. But ask yourself, what's taking place at, the, uh, at this second or third level of meaning in this death march um, to King's Cross? Well, the Horcrux is, as we saw, the horrible or dreaded cross. What does Harry do? in that march to his death that Rebecca described so well. He picks up his cross. He accepts the horrible cross. And goes to his death in sacrifice. So this is Mark 8.34. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life, now remember, think of those last chapters in the seventh book, uh, in the context of this. Whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? And of course, that's the contrast with Voldemort, who's trying to gain the whole world, in his pursuit at the level of plot of the Horcruxes. What are the deathly hallows? Well, they're an attempt to acquire the power of God. Remember the symbol. Now, this is where we get this symbol. This is from a stained glass window in a church in Mackinac Island. It's a Jesuit church. Uh, the church itself wasn't founded, wasn't built by Father Marquette, but the, the community was founded by Father Marquette. It's the first window you'll see if you go in and look on the left. I happen to be on vacation just after I finished the book. And you remember the symbol throughout the book until near the end, the symbol for that 
community that was in search of the Horcrux, or um, the deathly ha the Hallows, right? it kept being described as it looked like an eye within a triangle. This is a late medieval symbol for the power of God, the power and providence of God. It's called the all seeing eye. And you see the obvious symbolism, right? The triangle is the Trinity, the eye is the knowing, the providential gaze of God, and the power of God over things. So, what is it to search after the Hallows? It's to try to acquire that power of God. But then we look at the scripture. He did not regard equality with God something to be grasped at. He humbled himself, become, becoming obedient to death. Remember, Harry learns that this is what he has to do, and he's obedient. Even death on a cross. He accepts the dreaded cross, and where do we find out, find out that he ends up having accepted the dreaded cross and that marvelous march through the woods where you think, oh, this is just kidding. Brings anybody to tears. If you didn't start to cry on that scene, you know there's something wrong with you. <laughs> but he's accompanied by these saints on his march. And he ends up at, uh -huh, fun, fun, if you're familiar with English, King's Cross Station. But just put the definite article in front of that. The King's Cross. He accepts his cross. So the deathly hollows are an attempt to acquire the power of God, the holy, which will give immortality without death. And we go back to the back of the philosopher's stone on that. Not the sorcerer's stone, it was the philosopher's stone. And the effort to acquire power without sacrifice. And thus power without love. Love is displayed in sacrifice. For it is in sacrifice that we express love. No greater love hath a man than that he lay down his life for his friends. So it is Hallows, it is Hallows versus or Hallows or Horcruxes. The power of the Holy acquired through magic or through sacrifice. Harry chooses the Horcrux. Taking up his dreaded cross, Harry ends up at the King's Cross, where he is given his life back, free from the power of Voldemort. So lastly, Harry is Christ figure, the holy unicorn. As I say, not, not an allegory. He goes willing to his death for the sake of others. Ends up at King's Cross. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But earth, or but each in his own turn. Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The inscription on his parents' tombstone, illuminated by the church. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him and put everything under him, so that God may be all in all. And so Harry is this unicorn. This is all the way back to the first book. Right? The reversal in book seven of the image of the unicorn in book one. What does the shedding of the blood of the unicorn achieve if it is offered voluntarily or freely rather than being taken involuntarily? Harry is this unicorn. Again, a Christ figure. He's not Christ. A Christ figure. But to see that, you have to read it at the level of these symbols that she's clearly choosing. Hallows are poor Christ. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? So Harry is this holy unicorn, offering himself and his blood, the Christ figure. Now, uh, that's the end. I thought I would leave this up here, except if I was last, but I'm not last, because I thought this might creep you out. Um, you know, sort of left up here. The all-seeing eye looking at you. But uh, as I say, read it beyond the mere plot, and you will see God is everywhere. And not just a kind of vague, deistic, Oh, God is there. But explicitly, a Christian conception of sacrifice, love, and the divine. 
And I do want to say, since Dan mentioned it, the title Harry, Catholic, Harry Potter Catholic Boy, that's not the title of my piece. The editor put that on there. I don't claim in the piece that he's a Catholic boy. That's an editor's. But anyway, thank you for listening. Some of you might be wondering, what does this have to do with Harry Potter? Einstein, a very, very smart guy. Uh, I've been a student here for a long time, and uh, just for once I wanted to be the guy writing stuff on the chalkboard, so it has nothing to do with it at all. <laughs> yeah, um, so last night I was thinking, I was sitting there at my desk, and uh, it was about 2 o'clock in the morning, and I had, uh, I reenacted one of those, you know, from, from the cartoons, and you got on one shoulder, you got the little, uh, the little angel guy, on the other shoulder, you got the little devil. And uh, they were going back and forth, and the, uh, the angel guy's like, dude, you got a lecture tomorrow. You should probably, like, you know, prepare something. And then the other guy's like, yeah, but you spend the entire summer, you, you talk to, like, how many thousands of Harry Potter fans in over 45 cities, you'll figure it out. You'll think of something, you know, witty and profound and erudite to say to contribute to the discussion. And, uh, but as you can see from the chalkboard there, clearly, this shoulder won. <laughs> So I'm about to bring the level of the intellectual level of the discussion from here to about here, and uh, just kill some time by telling you some uh, funny stories and kind of crazy things that I've seen in the past uh, eight and a half years running the website. So I'll start off a little bit by saying, you know, who am I? Uh, how did I get? How the heck did MuggleNet happen in the first place? Uh, some people say, oh, you started this website. You must have been some kind of like web genius, computer prodigy. And the truth is, uh, no. I found one of those free web page makers when I was 12. And I had just started homeschooling, actually. And I wasn't thinking, oh, I know what I'm going to do now. I'm going to create the world's largest Harry Potter website, and it's going to be great, and my friends are all going to think I'm really cool. Uh, I just, I, I thought, oh, I'll just, I'll, it'll be fun to make a website or something. So, Harry Potter, yeah, I like Harry Potter. That's cool. And then I got really obsessed. <laughs> And then my friends knew I wasn't cool. <laughs> but who's laughing now? <laughs> so um, I started building up the site really slowly. Um, I just invested way, way too much of my free time um, building the website up, making it, you know, adding more content, more interactivity. Uh, I started putting together a large staff of really dedicated, passionate Harry Potter fans who. You know, we're, we're good at you know, graphics, or the good writers, or good, you know, just work horses, whatever they were really good at. And the website started growing a lot. It started getting a lot more traffic. At first, my parents just thought, oh, you know, that's, that's cute. Emerson's making a Harry Potter website. You know, that's, that's great. And then all of a sudden, like, the website started getting a lot of attention. It was featured in the BBC, and then it was a USA Today hot site. And then my parents started, you know, looking at it in kind of a different way. Uh, so over the years, I've got to do, uh, the website now, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, uh, is again called MuggleNet.com, is by far the internet's largest Harry Potter website, and fans over 40 million a month visit from all around the world. So I'm really proud of how big it's become. And because of the website, I've got to do a lot of really, really cool things. Um, earlier, the professor showed you uh, a picture from the, uh, the movie of the Gryffindor Common Room. And I was actually lucky enough to be invited to the set of uh, Goblet of Fire. It was on Warner Brothers' ticket, and they, uh, they, they flew me out there to see it. And so I got to interview a lot of the cast and crew, and I got to see it. And it was, it's not really as glamorous as you think it'd be. You know, you think, oh, Harry Potter, a movie, oh, this, you feel like you're walking into Hogwarts. And uh, when you actually you walk into this gigantic barn, and then, like, you see huge, huge, just plywood walls set up everywhere. And inside the walls are the actual sets are. And the actual sets are really neat. That's when you feel like you're actually stepping into the books for the first time. Um, I was promised this whole, uh, because a friend of mine, Melissa Nelly, had got to go um, to the Prisoner of Azkaban set. And she'd promised that, you know, when you first step into that great hall, you are just captured by this 
just incredible feeling, this incredible emotion where you really feel like you're in the books for the first time. And so, you know, she was, she was there this time too, and she built it up like the whole week we were talking about it. And uh, finally, you know, the, the, gra- the, the doors were thrown open, and I saw a lot of cement. It was a bit of a letdown, but it was under construction. But uh, anyway, the reason I mentioned the, the common room was because uh, that was another one of those experiences where I was walking up the steps to go to the common room. And when I walked in, it was similar to... If you guys have ever seen that commercial with... Uh, there, it's a commercial like for a fake TV show where this newly married couple, whatever, have to live inside this tiny, tiny little house. <laughs> yeah, the chairs were about this big. Like, not, not literally, but they were made for, like, children. Because it's easy to forget that those kids in the movies, you know, they're really not very big. So when I, I tried to sit down in one of these, you know, notoriously comfortable Gryffindor common room chairs, and, you know, it's a bit of a letdown because my butt wasn't even getting fit. <laughs> what are you going to do? So uh, other really, really fun things I've got to do was... Um, uh, like I mentioned, this summer, I, I spent the entire summer traveling and talking to Harry Potter fans, 45 cities all around the U.S. and Canada. And actually, I, I didn't spend the whole summer so much as talking to Harry Potter fans as I did uh, uh, arguing with them. Because, um, because of the website, we actually uh, published a book called MuggleNet.com's What Will Happen in Harry Potter 7. The book actually spent 26 weeks on the New York Times uh, children's bestseller list at the number two spot and sold over 300,000 copies. But in the book, we put forth a theory that was uh, very controversial. We, we made the, the radical claim that Harry Potter was a horcrux. <laughs> a lot of fans didn't like that. Not a popular theory at all. But sure enough, uh, so every, every, every time we would talk, I went with uh, Ben Shane, who's actually starting here uh, next semester. And as soon as the theory came up, the entire hour would just be, Harry can't be Horcrux because X, Y, Z, you consider it. Back and forth the whole time. Uh, so anyway, the, the tour was, was a lot of fun. Got to meet a lot of really, really inspiring uh, Harry Potter fans. And uh, later on in the tour, we uh, were at the... We were in L.A. for a week. Uh, we were there for the Prisoner of Azkaban premiere. Or not Prisoner of Azkaban, that would be Order of the Phoenix. Years after that. Uh, although I did actually get to go to the Prisoner of Azkaban uh, premiere, which was also really, really cool. The Goblet of Fire premiere, they were, they, those were all in New York. And uh, the Order of the Phoenix premiere, for the first time, was in L.A. Uh, but uh, the premiere was fun and all. You know, you get to oh the red carpet. Uh, there was this, uh, for the first time ever, Warner Brothers, when they were deciding, like, who got to be where on the red carpet, like, if you're near the front of the red carpet, you get, uh, like, more space, and you get to, like, ask the, the actors as many questions as you want coming down the line, and if you're near the back, you basically have to, like, you know, club other reporters in the head, and, like, get, get a microphone close enough for them to hear it, uh, and for the other premieres, we'd always been near the back because we were just a Harry Potter website, but this time they used a different method of like deciding who got to be near the front, and they did it based on who would reach the most Harry po- potential Harry Potter fans. And so we were like number three, and we were ahead of Fox News, and Fox News didn't like that. <laughs> they didn't like that. Who's this kid? Why is he ahead of us? And like, Entertainment Weekly was next to them, but they didn't really care. And then you keep going down the line, and I felt, ah, I was, you know, I was like, <laughs> yeah. But um, cool during the premiere was after the premiere, um, there was the after party. And the after party was like this, uh, this, it was like a carnival, like a Harry Potter carnival. Now, imagine what you would do if you wanted to throw a party, like a sweet party, Harry Potter themed, and you had $2 million to spend on it. That was what this was. Like, there was all these games, like, there was a... And the games didn't really make any sense, because they tried to make them, like, Harry Potter-themed, but I don't really understand how you get from, like, you know, like, bowling little hippogriffs over to... You get the idea. Not much of a connection. But, um, it, it, it's really... There's more food than you can possibly ever eat, and just the decorations are just absolutely incredible. I felt like it was like walking in the movie set, practically. It was so realistic that you, uh... You walk in the bathroom, you walk in the, you know, the guy's room, and you, you go up to the urinal, right? And then uh, all of a sudden, you're just doing your mind your business, whatever. Then you hear, 
And you look over and you see that, you know, in, in Umbridge's office, they've got all the little cats on the plates. They had the cats in the bathroom staring at you while you took a pee. It's one of the most traumatizing experiences of my entire life. Yeah. Anyway, like the cool parts when you're walking around, all of a sudden you're just walking by and you see some like short guy walking by. Oh, that was Dan. Oh, what's up, Dan? And uh, it's cool about that. He calls me Muggle Knight because he can never remember my name. <laughs> it's kind of insulting because I've met him like a bunch of times now, but he never remembers my name, even though I have a really, really weird name. But uh, yeah, that's one one of the cool things is also like getting to know some like the cast and crew. Uh, Luna Lovegood, the the girl who plays Luna Lovegood. Her name is Ivana Lynch, and she's like a really, really big um, like Mugglenet fan. And we like talk on like AIM and stuff. But one time, uh, <laughs> sorry, <I'm> like <laughs> one time, uh, some of my friends back home kind of like found out like the extent of my nerdiness, and uh, they figured out which person on AIM she was, and um, maybe that night there had been some consumption of some. Legal, because of course they're all of rage. And uh, <laughs> things unraveled from there, and they started IMing her. And, uh, but the good news is she was cool with it. Totally cool with it. Oh, <laughs> so that was funny. Thank God. Uh, yeah, so but those experiences, of course, can't even compare to the one I got two years ago um, when I received a phone call one morning. Just this random morning in May. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. And, of course, I was sleeping. 8 o'clock in the morning. I was back at home. And my dad just comes bursting into my room. And he's got this panic look on his face. And he goes, I wish... It's Joe! So, my first thought, you know, why is this guy named Joe calling me? <laughs> at 8 o'clock in the morning. It's better be good. So he hands me the phone, and, uh... <clears throat> You know, it was 8 o'clock in the morning, just woken up, so I sounded like Barry White. <clears throat> no. <laughs> Hello, Bristol, this is Joe. Uh, so then, you know, the reason she was calling was, of course, uh, she wanted to know if it, it was J.K. Rowling, by the way. <laughs> if that wasn't already, you know kind of obvious, uh, you know, we're cool, we chat all the time, you know, no big deal, no big deal. <laughs> I wish, but, uh, the reason she was calling was she wanted to know if I'd be interested, interested, <laughs> in coming to Scotland to interview her in her home on the day of the release of the sixth book. <laughs> but I played it cool, I played it cool, I said, Joe, <laughs> I'll check my schedule. <laughs> Maybe I can fit you in. <laughs> Our people will talk. We'll figure something out, right? Uh, no. Of course, I was thrilled. I was just... You can imagine, right? J.K. Rowling, she's, she's cool and all. Uh, so the interview ended up being a huge, huge success. She's one of the coolest, most down-to-earth people you could ever meet. And uh, I really felt like... I felt like we shared a bond. <laughs> we shared a connection... And I've only ever talked to her twice since then. But I'm sure that like the, the year or six months between the times we talked, she was thinking about me all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, we basically, uh, I did the interview with, also with Melissa, and we just spent like two and a half hours just interrogating her on, like, on, on the most irrelevant things you can imagine. They're, well, they're not irrelevant, but other people would consider them to be irrelevant. Just, you know, the real hardball Harry Potter questions. And uh, the interview was actually only supposed to go for an hour. And... It ended up going for over two and a half hours, so I feel really, really privileged. Even though the hotel we ended up staying in, we, uh, it was a, you could say, a miscommunication. It was about the size of a cereal box. <laughs> the shower, like literally, like it was one of those, it was so small that there wasn't a shower that actually had uh, like walls. You just walk in the bathroom, and then there's a toilet, and then the shower just shoots out in the ground. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of relevant, but... Uh, And this is the part where I feel like I should probably say something, uh, I should contribute something to the intellectual nature of this, uh, of this event. Uh, but I got nothing. <laughs> well, actually, what I would say is, um, 
I, did, I got to do a lot of a lot. I, I did a lot of interviews this summer because there was since J.K. Rowling doesn't do interviews very often, and, and the actors are all in England, and they don't do uh, interviews very often either. Whenever there's a Harry Potter story out, the American journalists all go, oh, let's talk to that guy, the, the, the nerdy kid, made the website. Yeah, we'll talk to him. So there was a period for about two weeks where literally every morning from about six, when the first radio shows would call in, to about five o'clock, I would be on the phone, like, all the time. And there was one question that I was asked in virtually every single interview I ever did. Why Harry Potter? And fortunately, I... Uh, well, I didn't have a good answer, but at least I had an answer. When I, the first time I was asked that question, I was like, well, um, it's good. <laughs> you should try it. Like, a lot of people can't be wrong. You know? uh, no, I, I, what, what I really think about Harry Potter is that it that makes... The reason why there's fans in this room between the ages of... Six, seven? Nine. Nine? <laughs> It's a compliment. One day people will thank you. Like, oh. <laughs> and I'm not going to name ages, because I'm not good at that, but old. And the reason why... <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't make eye contact with anybody. Just, <laughs> just to cover myself here, okay? Yeah. All right. Is because <laughs> Harry Potter is just... He's so universally human that everybody can relate to him in some way. It's like everybody can see a bit of themselves in Harry. And Harry Potter is just... It, it's not about, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys, when I read Harry Potter for the first time, it wasn't about casting spells and flying broomsticks and that I loved reading about wizards. Because I, I wasn't like opposed to the idea, but it wasn't something that I, I wasn't really a huge fantasy reader at that point. But what it is, is just that Harry Potter is just a great story with wonderful characters that are easy to fall in love with. That's the only way I can think of it. It's just a great story, and a great story is that no matter what the subject is. And that's why so many more and more people are being converted. Converted. <laughs> I guess that's kind of relevant to the theme, right? Uh, not really. Uh, because they're, they, they, they're giving Harry Potter a chance for the first time. And that's why people ask me now, uh, you know, after like all my roommates and stuff, you know, after they ask me like a thousand times, how much do you make, how much do you make, how much do you make, they always ask, well, what's next? Your life's over, right? No more Harry Potter books? But I say nay nay. <laughs> I say there's still two more movies left. I say J.K. Rowling <laughs> is writing another book. Now, it's not a continuation of Harry's journey, but she did admit that she's writing an encyclopedia. Because at her house in Scotland, which is huge, by the way, huge. I actually joked, I joked that it was the size of a cat. I joked that it was a castle to, um, I think, some guy from the San Diego Union Tribune. And he quoted that. Literally. <laughs> and so, it hit, that article hit the AP, and so every single article uh, about the trip mentioned that she lived in a castle, and of course, <laughs> she didn't. And, uh, yeah, journalists are no good. Because there was another time when, uh, I don't mean that literally, but um, I made a joke. Um, I, I, there was a running gag I had at all the events I did over the summer where I, I went through this long spiel about how it would be really cool if, uh, you know, there's a final battle like where, um, you know, all the, like the good side and the bad side were fighting. And, you know, on, on the bad side, there was like the werewolves and the vampires and the death eaters and stuff. And then on the good side, you know, there was the house elves, there was the ministry, there was you know, the Dumbledore's army. And the U.S. military. <laughs> <laughs> it was meant to be a joke. I said, you know, I'd like to see them expelliarmus a nuclear ballistic missile. <laughs> sarcastic. I thought quite clearly sarcastic. Clearly you agree. You laughed. Uh, this, whoever, the journalist who uh, reported on me then clearly didn't understand my humor. Uh, it must have gone way over his head. Uh, but anyway, that, that article also hit the AP and uh, I had to answer a lot of questions about that. A lot of questions. I actually did say, I, I, like before that, that actually happened though, I did uh, I did uh, an interview for Fox and Friends, and I said it on the air, and I figured, oh, well, this time it'll be okay because I can actually, you know, use inflection, and I can, they can they'll be able to see the dry sarcasm just dripping, you know, all over. <laughs> but, uh, no. No, I got lots and lots of emails. People don't think I'm very smart. <laughs> 
But that's okay. Because um, I don't remember. I, I had a reason for going to this whole journalism thing, but I don't remember anymore. So, and I made, I made my, my profound uh, comment about why Harry Potter is important. So I'm going to end it there. Centers tonight, and I want to open it up now to your questions. Uh, please feel free to address your questions to one of our pan- panelists uh, or more, but please indicate specifically who your question is addre- addressed to when you ask. So the floor is open. Yes, sir. Oh yeah, sorry. Um, <laughs> that's right. I did have a point. I knew. Uh, I knew I had a. I knew I. Had, I knew I. Had, I knew I had a point. Um, I knew I had. A, yeah. All right. My point was that at her house in Scotland, she has just crates and crates and crates that are stacked to the ceiling that have all these journals containing all the all these notes she'd written about the series, character backstory, and plots that she just didn't have room for in the books. And so she's putting those into an encyclopedia, like a reader's guide, for us really, really, really obsessed fans to salivate over. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, in fact. Um, this is a question. Uh, Could you stand? The man on the... Right here. Mysterious character. <laughs> um, I feel like a lot of the symbolism you're talking about in the book is amazing, but I guess I would wonder how much of it you think J.K. Rowling really intended, or if how much of that was really just kind of her writing in culture. I mean, the idea, for instance, of, of Malfoy and Lucius, those are kind of, I mean, when I read the book, I was like, oh, you can pick up on kind of a negative connotation there. How much of it was intended, do you think? And perhaps that's a question for um, Everson, too. Yeah, I'm not sure that uh, you, is it working? That, that that's a, um, as I say, anybody who really knew about literary criticism and literature and art would say everything I've said is just sort of, you know, silly and so on. But I don't think that you can, it's an interesting question, but it's certainly not a question you can definitively answer without her saying so. Uh, but one of the points about uh, symbols within a culture and a larger story, and that goes back to that original slide with the quote from Wittgenstein on it, these symbols have a life within a culture. And so the question of authorial intention, right, in a way has to fit into a larger setting when she chooses to adopt symbols right, from that culture. The, the life of the symbol lives within the culture and not simply within the, lo- <laughs> life, the mind of the author. Right? So I myself think that she, given the number of these symbols, right? And particularly given the fact that things become explicit in the the seventh book, like placing a sign of the cross over a grave, right? The number of symbols, the kind of references, the the flatly allegorical uh, story of St. George and the dragon, I think an awful lot of it had to have been intentional and conscious. But that doesn't take away from the fact that some of it may just simply be meaning that's present in the story that she doesn't explicitly intend, but nonetheless the symbols bear because of the life they have within the larger cultural setting. Writing doesn't take place in a cultural vacuum. If you choose to um, write a story about a phoenix that saves uh, uh, children from a prison, uh, whether you intend that to be read as the harrowing of hell You can't help have it read that way, and it's a legitimate reading, precisely because that's the life of the symbol. So you you have a kind of obligation to the symbols you take up to recognize their meaning once that that meaning becomes available. Clear symbolism that she intended. uh, I think most of it, I've I've sat through a lot of, uh, I've heard every theory you can possibly imagine that any Harry Potter fan ever thought, and they used lots of you know, really weak symbolism to draw these theories out, but there were some that were really, really interesting, uh, some of which the um, professor pointed out earlier, but um, clearly she, she definitely, a, a lot of it is very deliberate. Yes. Uh, my question is for Professor Jones. Um, you know, I was disappointed with uh, Dumbledore's death, or at least the way that he described it in the seventh book. Uh, I thought it was close to maybe a 
mercy killing. And I was wondering what you thought about this in, uh, with, with, in light of this talk on courage that you gave. It seems like you didn't show a lot of courage in the face of that. Is he? Is this just one of Dumbledore's flaws, or how do you fit into that? No, I think Dumbledore. Is this on? I think Dumbledore died for Draco. I think it was another sacrificial death. I think Dumbledore learned his lesson, his power-seeking lesson, his Voldemort-like quest. He realized that that was empty, and since he took up his post at Hogwarts, although he still had lingering temptations, obviously, I think in the end um, he knew that Voldemort was going to was going to get Draco, and. He had dedicated his life to the protection of his students, and I think his death was just a continuation of that kind of, again, sacrificial love for Draco. Because he knew so all Snape had to kill Dumbledore in order for that love? Well, to Snape, again, was also doing this for Draco. Sure. I mean, sure. the, the idea being, you know, if Snape did it, we would think that Draco, you know, Voldemort would think that Draco did it, and then we wouldn't have to get um, Draco you know, victimized by Voldemort anymore. So I, I think that's consistent with, with Dumbledore. Um, but the question I, I'm always, I'm still toying with on the virtue theme, um, and, and I think that the interesting thing about Book 7 is the way it kind of complicates each character. Nobody's sort of a pure type of any virtue. Um, what we really need is the community to be virtuous and to uphold us when other members of the community fail. And so this is, you know, partly my own question for Emerson, too, but to what extent do um, the four characters, Ron, Hermione, Harry, and Snape, <coughs> represent the four houses and some implicit unity of the virtues, the idea that not only within the courageous community do we need people to step up when others fail, but also within the community at large do different people embody different virtues in ways that make the community as a whole able, all four houses together, able to embody virtue in a way that no single human being in their fallibility is able to do. <laughs> Sorry. I think she makes a lot of good points. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I don't think I can top that at all. Uh, if I had anything to contribute of worthwhile, I would certainly contribute it. Can I a different way? Do you think there's anything to the theory that Harry is the paradigmatic Gryffindor, Hermione the paradigmatic Ravenclaw symbolizing wisdom, Ron the paradigmatic Hufflepuff with his patience and his steadfastness, and Snape the paradigmatic Slytherin? And we need all four for things to come together in the end. Think there's anything to it? I think it is an interesting theory. Um, I actually, I heard the. <laughs> you didn't even give me a chance to start. I say, well, whatever. We'll put it on the wall of shame. <laughs> oh, the wall of shame. Um, I actually, I actually originally heard that theory, but Ginny was the fourth member of the trio, and Ginny was the Slytherin, and she does display certain Slytherin characteristics. I think she is. You could say she's cunning. I, I apparently heard her bat bogey hex. Is something to be feared. <laughs> so I'm not sure whether uh, J.K. Rowling intended it that way, but I do think it is certainly it is noteworthy. Um, I have a question for Emerson. Are you single? Yeah. <laughs> She had the idea for a story when she was on a train to London, 
And it, she just, uh, originally, just it was just about a boy, and she started creating his life. And then the moral messages started uh, like happening while she was writing, but she didn't plan to before. Um, I think it, you definitely have to say that all good literature starts with the plot. Right? If you don't have a good plot, who cares what the symbolism is? Right? It's, it's awful reading and so on. So uh, certainly the plot comes first. But I think, uh, not, so, not so much, I think Emerson is, is right, I think, about that. Uh, the difference between when she starts out writing and what ends up in the first book versus is, there, um, is, the, is this story uh, at this level of, of symbolism and um, the discussion of morality and so on, is that present in the first book as a kind of um, start for the whole thing? And I think uh, it clearly is. Um, and that's why, for instance, I tried to emphasize that notion of the unicorn, right? That you end up with this slaughtering of Harry at the end uh, that, that is, is a, a return to that question of the unicorn. And also, um, just some of the things that Dumbledore tells Harry at the end. You remember the scene when um, Quirrell uh, tries to kill uh, Harry, and um, Harry says something like, why are you... Uh, you could probably quote it word for word, but <laughs> Harry says something like, why are you doing this evil thing to me? And Quirrell, or Voldemort, in the voice of Quirrell says, there is no evil. There's only power for those who are afraid to use it. That's right out of Nietzsche. Well, in the resolution, that is, um, when Dumbledore is talking to him after he's recovered, uh, Dumbledore gives him a different view of philosophy, if it's not the Sorcerer's Stone, but the Philosopher's Stone. Nietzsche had a, a kind of philosophy and the, and the life of excellence as a pursuit of power. Uh, Dumbledore says to Harry, with regard to Nicholas just dying, giving up the search for the Philosopher's Stone, which is really a search for power. And Harry says, you mean he's just going to die? And Dumbledore says, yeah, well, what's wrong with that? For the well-prepared mind, death is simply the next adventure. That might as well be right out of um, Socrates. That is... Philosophy, genuine philosophy, is preparation for death. And of course, all of the stories are about how to die and how to die well. So I think in that regard, um, from the first book on, uh, even though the most important thing upon which everything is built is a really good story, this moral story and this larger symbolic story is present from the very beginning in the first book. Um, yeah, my question was sort of for the whole panel. It was this idea that I've been working with ever since I read the seventh book, and that was that Dumbledore. Once we get to that King's Cross scene, one of the most pivotal scenes in the entire series, it was that J.K. Rowling was telling all of us that Dumbledore is God, because Dumbledore throughout the entire books is always that figure that's never directly involved in many of the series' pivotal events, but he always comes and emerges at the end to sort of explain what's happened to us that infinite wisdom that he has, and he's always had a better sense and understanding than the rest of the players as to what was truly going on in the series. And much like sort of uh, what a theological view of God is, is that Dumbledore always provides Harry with the answers and the tools that he needs. He never puts Harry in a situation that he's not going to be able to get himself out of. He never puts him through more than he needs to. But at the same time, he never gives Harry what he wants. He never gives him the answers when he wants them. And the one other um, was that Voldemort sort of represents the devil. And while Voldemort was once with Dumbledore at Hogwarts, uh, Dumbledore kicks Voldemort out of Hogwarts and because of his quest for power. And now Dumbledore and Voldemort are competing sort of for the hearts and souls of the rest of men in the books, just like God and the devil now compete for all of men today. And the last point that I had was also that Dumbledore is always toying with that idea of free will. That, that we sort too soon. He's the one who always gives people that final chance. He's the one who will never turn on Snape, who always believes in the better side of Snape. He's the one who always believes in Draco. At the last moment, when Draco is about to kill Dumbledore, Dumbledore still believes in the best of Draco, and he's willing to sort of sacrifice himself to give Draco that final shot of redemption. And he's the one who always believes in the best of mankind. So I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that idea of mine. Dumbledore, in a sense, represents, and he does have that archetypal view of God. He's got the long, long white beard in that sense. So. I know I went on for a while, but this is a lot of thoughts I have. <laughs>
I think the long white beard part sealed it. <laughs> My answer is no way he's fallible. And the seventh book brings that out as clearly as anybody else. And he says himself he's making educated guesses. So I would be a naysayer on the God theory. I would say um, he's not God, but he certainly uh, has certain symbolic features of the divine. Um, one reason for saying he's not God is, of course, he recognizes he's not worthy of the hallows. Right? And says, "I perhaps you, Harry, perhaps only you, but I couldn't, I couldn't do it." So, in terms of the story, he's not God suddenly appearing uh, and so on. But there are certainly features of uh, Dumbledore that, again, bring to mind the divine. Uh, way back in the first book, he tells Harry, uh, "You're going to have to have faith in me." You, I, I'll tell you what I can. I can't tell you everything now. I'll tell, you'll find out more um, as we go along. You'll understand more. So faith leads to a kind of understanding. Faith in Dumbledore does and so on. Um, and then he says, but, and of course I'll never lie to you. I may not tell you everything, but I'll never lie to you. And he does have certain features, again, that kind of bring to mind the divine, uh, his, his knowing, his, his ability to help you understand the great scheme of things and all that. But yeah, I wouldn't say that he is God. I would say, more like Harry, he brings to mind certain features of the divine, and that's his symbolic function. Listen, uh, question for the theory uh, Professor O'Callaghan, or Mr. O'Callaghan, or John even, <laughs> as opposed to you. <laughs> that's all right. It's not your fault. Right. Um, one thing I was confused about was whether Harry believed in God or not, because they celebrate Christmas, but there's never any mention of celebrations of God. So, uh, yeah. Um, again, this has to do with what happens if you bring, say, uh, Christian faith into the story. Then it becomes a churchy story. And it becomes a story, okay, where, where, where's Christ, and so on and so on. So that's, that's one element of why, why write a story where it's not obvious, you know, and so on. Um, I don't think Harry understands. And, and again, if you look at that graveyard scene, it's really enlightening. Enlightening. Right? Um, the illumination of the graves by the light of the church, singing the Christmas, Christmas hymns, um, uh, in anticipation of the birth of Christ. It's hard to get any more explicit sort of, again, reference to, uh, to uh, Christian faith than that. And yet, if you remember, Harry, said, Harry looks at the grave, uh, inscriptions on the graves, and he says, what do those mean? Right? So clearly he doesn't understand. He doesn't, in that sense, have Christian faith. Right? He doesn't understand what these mean, but the reader is supposed to see the reference and say he's missing something, he doesn't understand. It's not odd that he doesn't understand because he spent the first 12 years of his life uh, underneath the stairs, living underneath the stairs in a family that you don't anticipate was taking him to church every week and so on. So I don't, yeah, I don't think he understands and that's, that's part of the drama. Right? He doesn't understand his destiny. He, he has to come to an understanding of it. And she very cleverly, I think, as a good writer, avoids making it a kind of churchy story. But it's there. There's another a really interesting parallel scene uh, just before that, and that's when Voldemort is remembering killing his parents. And that's on All Hallows' Eve, right? Halloween. So the evening of Halloween becomes a parallel with Christmas Eve. All Hallows' Eve, um, Christmas Eve. And uh, Voldemort looks at all these kids running around in their costumes, right? And I, again, I can't remember the, the uh, word for word, but he says, he, he's kind of disgusted. He says, look at them all running around in all those little costumes, these cheesy commercial costumes of, of the modern uh, age, um, uh, mimicking uh, a world they no longer believe in. Right? These little kids, they're mimicking a world they no longer believe in. Because the world in which Halloween has a sense and a, and a reality is a world in which you think it's the eve of all saints. But they don't believe in that. And yet that's a parallel scene to coming across his parents' grave on Christmas Eve, the two eves, Halloween and Christmas Eve, where he comes to, he can at least see the inscriptions even if he doesn't understand them. It can't be said of him that he doesn't believe, he just doesn't know.
you've gotten used to me. I'm not typically brief, so I'll be brief. Um, I think the, I'm not a literary critic, but I think the writing got much better. Uh, I don't think the writing was bad in the first uh, book. It was very thrilling. But, I mean, some of the scenes are just, you know, uh, particularly the death of Dumbledore in the first instance. And then um, Harry walking off to uh, King's Cross. I mean, that's just, that's marvelous writing, you know. And, and when you can't put a book down, C.S. Lewis said, at least one measure, not the only measure, but one measure of good writing is that you want to read it again. And it certainly passes that test. We have time for uh, a couple more. Let's go. teachable you are 
and the grace you get given along the way or not, I mean, people get morally well-formed to a, a greater or lesser extent. So that's the best I could do on the long answer. Let me thank our panelists.